Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast, where we teach clients how to build wealth and create passive income without the risk of Wall Street. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen, along with our co-host, Anthony Faso. Anthony, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be in our own podcast room, and I'm really excited about this topic. This is something that that's really, that's really important to me and that I'm really passionate about. So I'm looking forward to sharing this today. Absolutely. Me too. This is probably one of the most common questions that we get uh, from clients as we start to talk about kind of where to put the money as we're saving. But uh, before we kind of jump in today, I want to make sure that our listeners know that uh, if they have any questions on this topic at all, they can easily book a uh, 15 minute phone call with Anthony or myself. And you can find those, uh, that process in the meeting notes after this is posted. So Great. Excellent. Let's get started. So some of the questions that uh, we often get from clients uh, is, should I have a policy on my kids? Kind of yes or no, Anthony, what are your initial kind of reactions when somebody asks you that? Well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go into a plug since you brought it up oh, that wow. way. And I'm so passionate about it. I actually did write a chapter in, in the book called Eight Perspectives on Prosperity Economics. And my chapter is called I Kid You Not why you should have a life insurance policy on your kid. And you know, I know it's interesting. Uh, well, we will put a link to the book in the notes, but if you go, if you ser- go on to Amazon and you search Anthony Faso, you want to know what comes up, Cameron? No. Okay. The book is actually the, the, the fourth thing. Okay. The third thing is some, well, there's actually a country in Africa, in Africa called Burkina Faso. So that's something like that's number three. Mm. Number two is something about adventure, the Avengers. So, I mean, that is kind of relatable to me. Uh, the, <laughs> the number one thing that comes up when you do an Amazon search for Anthony Faso, you ready for this? It's uh, a series of love ballads that's called <laughs> Medicine for the Soul. Now, if that alone isn't funny, what's, what I think is the most interesting thing is that that uh, CD is volume 284. Wow, okay. So there's a lot of more um, songs about with m- medicine to the soul. Why I'm coming up in there, I don't know. But uh, to me, having a policy on a kid is, is very important. I'm sure I'm going to share some personal experiences that I've had with uh, my kids. And also, I've, I've had some friends that their, their kids have passed. Sorry to hear that. Uh, thank you. But it is, and you know what, a lot of times we just, we never, th- we always think about life insurance. We always think about the death benefit. And if you're following us, you're probably, you're focusing on, on the cash value aspect, but there's ways that we can use that to, uh, to, to use that on your kids where we start a cash value focused policy. So I know we're, we're going to get into about some of the reasons on why we would uh, recommend putting the policy on the kid. Any, uh, what's your take Cameron? Yeah. Well, uh, there was a lot of uh, really good information in there that you shared with us, but I was surprised about one thing. <laughs> it was not about the ballads. <laughs> But I was surprised that it actually took you 12 seconds <laughs> to promote yourself in the book and the well, podcast. So good job. You held back. Yeah. Well done. Uh, now, when we get back to this topic is, uh, you know, there's kind of two sides to it is death benefit and then cash value. Um, uh, you know, obviously we focus on the cash value. And so um, what I was going to start with is really I want to talk about when we, if or when we do put a policy in our kids, what does that look like? One of the one of the biggest questions that I get is kind of, hey, do I still own that policy? Hmm. Right? Who's the beneficiary? Who's the insured? So, Anthony, you mind kind of covering those three bases with us? Because in, in the structure of any life insurance policy, there's really kind of three players. Number one is the the policy owner, the insured, and the beneficiary. So, kind of in that um, parent buying a policy on a kid structure. Can you kind of cover those three bases for us? Sure. It, when we're structuring a policy, particularly for the infinite banking concept, we're more focused on the cash value. Uh, we always like to say that the, the death benefit is ice on the cake, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like what I've done with the policies on my kids, I own them and control them. And I have used them. And then actually now my, my daughter's 20. So she's in college right now. And my son's 26. So he's finished at least this level of education. 
And now we're now he's starting to, to he's starting to pay the premiums. And as once he proves that he's going to be a good steward of it, which means paying the premiums, but also when he uses the money, he's got to pay it back. When he proves that, I'm going to give it to him. And because of some of the tax laws, when if the policy, as long as you give it to the insured, there are no there are no tax consequences. Ooh, for one, that's a good point. And before you kind of move on, let's touch on that one. Just a second. Mm-hmm. Could you kind of repeat what you had? Because what I found is that a lot of people don't understand that sentence. So you could just repeat what you said there. Sure. What you, the life insurance is? It it is an asset. Mm-hmm. that can be sold, it can be transferred, it can be turned in. And there's so many things that, that, that you can do with it. Now, one thing you can't, if you were to sell it to somebody, and I know that w- we have bought other people's policies at times before, then it becomes an investment. And that gain or that death benefit is going to become taxable. But in this situation, as there are special tax rules, and as long as you're giving, the, the, giving it to the insured, so the kid's the insured and the parent is, is the owner, that is not a taxable event. Awesome. So, so kind of that's the estate planning piece of this. It's, a, it's an element to it, um, which is a huge benefit, right? Is one of the things that I have written here in the notes is, you can pass nearly unlimited amounts of cash to the next generation via a transfer of policy to the insured. It will pass income and gift tax free, no need for probate, a trust, or even a will. So again, so an example of that, that we kind of see a lot is we see grandparents Hmm. that want to save or want to put money away for a kid's college education. And so that's one of the conversations that we have with them is where should we start saving money? And obviously life insurance, cash value life insurance comes up. And so what we'll see is we'll see kind of a grandma Mm-hmm. buying a policy on her daughter, right? Daughter might be 30, 40 year old adult at this mm-hmm. point, right? But then during her lifetime is she can transfer the cash value that's built up in that policy over to her daughter. Correct. Correct. And also in turn, if the grandparent buys a policy on their granddaughter and she builds up cash value, right? Takes it out when she's a newborn or a toddler and the, the girl reaches 18 years old, she can then transfer that policy over to the child, 18, 20 years old, or whatever she chooses, mm-hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. Very correct. cool, very cool, very cool. We have a, a lot of uh, business planning uh, that we do with that as well. So uh, that'll be a different topic, but uh, great point to bring up. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Hmm. About time. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of talked about that ownership, right? Is, is, uh, is there a comparison, right? So typically when we're kind of talking about this, I don't know how in depth we want to go with this, but are there t- other accounts that are usually come up in this conversation? We're talking about saving money for college or something like that, that you want to compare to? Yeah. A lot of times when somebody brings up or I bring, I, I bring up about a policy on a kid, a lot of the times most parents are using a 529 plan to finance for their uh, kids college. I tell you, I had done that myself for both of my kids. There are some advantages to that. It's kind of like a Roth where you put in after tax dollars. And as long as those funds are used for higher education, you do not pay a gain, uh, assuming there is a gain on the funds. Sounds, sounds pretty cool until you start looking into some of the details, like for one, what happened with my son, he lost, he lost 50% of his 529 plan in 2008. And, or was it 60? I don't know. One of my kids lost 50. One of them lost 60%. And the thing was, of course, my financial planner at the time said, Anthony, look, it goes down and then it comes up. Yada, yada, yada. The thing is, my son was going to college in two years. I didn't have time for the yada, yada, yada. So I actually, I actually took, personally, I took the funds out of their 529 plan, and that's how I started their first life insurance policy. But one of the other downsides of a 529 plan, and a lot of parents don't like to hear it, but we need to tell our clients what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. I know where you're going. Okay. Not everybody is going to go to college. Mm -hmm. Particularly now the price of college is skyrocketing. 
and they're coming out of school with debt and difficulty fi of finding a job. And there's a lot of other ways to m make money, particularly listen to this, where it's ways to make passive income. Yeah. You, you, don't need a re you don't need a college degree to own a re uh, rental property. But I also say, well, what if your kids get a scholarship? Or what if they decide to stay home? Or like what I did, I went in the army and the army paid for, for my schooling. If you end up, th there's a risk that you may have more money in your 529 plan than you need. And, and Cameron, you, you know what happens no, when that happens? Tell me, tell me. You have to, that gain that if you take it out for non-educational purposes, it's going to be subject, the gain subject to tax and a 10% penalty. I have, I have three kids they are nine, seven and five right now. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I look at those three kids. I love them all to death and they're all very gifted and talented, but uh, the likelihood of all three of my children going to college is not very high. Right. I mean, if I look at myself and my siblings, you know, we all didn't finish college. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a conversation that we like to have with clients. Um, when I look at my kids too, again, is that, man, if they don't go to college, I'd love to have cash available for them to either send them to a trade school. Right. Mm -hmm. I read an article this morning that welders are making 150,000 plus a year. Right. Mm -hmm. Great option for kids. Send them to an internship, send them off somewhere where they can spend a month over the summer learning about a specific job. Or even if my kid comes to me when he's 20, 22 years old and wants to start a business, I'd love to be able to have 100, 150,000 available to give to the kid to start his business. Exactly. And I feel the same way. And that's why I don't call it the, their college savings plan. I call it their educational savings plan. Because there's, there's many other ways to get educated outside of a traditional four-year degree. It may be taking a course on real estate. Yeah. Or it may be starting your own business or whatever that or is. I've told my kids that you, you need to be educated. You, you, you need to learn a skill. And maybe it's through college. Maybe it's not. But you need to be able to take care of yourself. And you need to become educated. The, the term that I use when I talk about 529 plans is um, if they're used for their very specific and limited purpose, they're really good. But anything outside of that? They, they start to lose their luster, right? And so what I tell clients is I say, I hate being pigeonholed because I want to keep my options open and available to me. And that's why the cash value life insurance allows me to do, right? Keep my options available and open for my kids. Yeah, and I don't, and well, as you know about our philosophy and our hierarchy of wealth, 529 plans are in tier four. The tier four is something that is speculative, meaning you have no control and you have no collateral when you're investing in the market. Is this something that you should be investing in for your kids' education? I think my kids are a prime example where we were doing what Wall Street and what CPAs and financial planners were doing, and he lost more than half of his educational fund. And, and here's the thing that pisses me off, is that it was no fault of his or mine. Yeah. You know, these are things that are out of control. And then here's something cool. Well, at least I think it is. You know, there, we're not limited in when we have a life insurance policy, right? Uh, now, just even comparing that, that cash value, we have a guaranteed growth, and it's going to grow, it's going to grow tax-free. But when you have that cash value in there, should you just let it sit? No. Right. If an opportunity comes, you can use a policy J just like we're teaching our, the, the, the parents to do to buy rental properties. Why can't you do the same thing with your kids, with your kids policy? In fact, my daughter right now is we are, we're in the process of buying her uh, first rental property. Good job, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Sarah. Um, but, but in essence, what, what we're doing, is we have some cash value inside our policy that's just sitting there. And so we're gonna put it to work. So what she's gonna do is we're gonna take about 20, 25,000 out, put it, uh, a, a down payment on a house, particularly like if you listen to our other podcasts, you know, on some turnkey real estate, 
she's going to have to pay for that property with the down payment and closing costs about uh, about twenty five thousand well, dollars. Now then, so she has a policy loan of twenty five grand. Cameron, who's going to pay? Who's going to pay the interest and that principal back on that policy loan? Who will the asset that you purchase is paying? Yeah, the tenants are going to pay it. Mm -hmm. At some point, that loan's going to be paid off. It may be eight years, it may be 12 years, it may be 20 years. The point is, it doesn't matter. At some point, that loan is going to be paid off. So then Sarah will have all the money back into her policy, growing. We, we never broke the compound interest curve. She didn't pay a dime of tax on all that growth. And she has a rental property. And then once that loan is paid off, you know what we're going to do, Cameron? I would go buy another one. We're going to hit, we're going to hit the repeat button. We're going to buy another one. Now she's got two rental properties. Couldn't we pay back that loan even faster? Absolutely. Right. And then we just continue this same thing. So if we look out just with Sarah, we have her policy doing multiple things, right? It, it, it's funding her, it's funding her education you know, through policy loans. And when she graduates, uh, when she graduates, I'm going to have her read N Nelson's book, Becoming Your Own Banker, and I'm going to show, show her the policy. I'm going to say, hey, Sarah, well, you, you're going to work with all these other, your other peers, they're all, going to have they're all going to have student loans. You don't. I want you to take some of your paycheck and start paying back these policy loans like your coworkers are with their student loans. And then instead of funding your IRA or 401k, I want you to take over the premiums. Then she will have shown me that, that she's capable. And then I'm, I'm going to give her the policy. Now, the thing is, she has all the money back in, in her policy. She has a rental property or two, and she's already on the road to financial freedom. She's already, has, she's already learning about creating passive income. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love that. And I love the, the, the scenario that you're describing there is because um, we don't stop at college, right? So a typical, yeah, sc yeah. typical scenario when somebody comes in and they say, hey, you know, Cam, I want to start saving, whether it's my kids or my grandkids, I want to start putting money away, is their, their vision is college and it ends right there, right? Part of the conversation that we have is that, listen, the need for finance or the need for the kids' money is going to continue past college tuition and move forward. And so that's what we talk about. So a typical scenario that I'll see is I'll have mom or dad or grandma and grandpa kind of start saving money for a kid. Let's say the kid's 10 years old. So they're going to fund a policy from ages 10 to 18. And what they do is they go to 18 and now they have a, a cost of college tuition. They're going to take a loan against that cash value and pay that tuition. Now there's two really cool things that I want to highlight here when, when we do that. Number one is that our cash value never stops growing right? You touched on that. That is the compound curve, the consistency. It just never ends for us. We've taken a loan against it and we have the ability to pay it back. But also number two is that currently right now, cash value life insurance is not recognized as an asset on the FAFSA form, mm -hmm. right? So it is a great opportunity. It's a great, it's a, uh, I'm trying to find the wording here because I wrote it down and I want to sound really eloquent. Good luck. <laughs> It's a very effective way of saving for college because it does not eliminate the possibility of that school providing aid in some way to our child, right? So again, we're putting our kid in a better position to receive some sort of aid if we've got cash share value that's available to us. And now once we go to college, right, we have these loans outstanding like Anthony just talked about. But again, that's where most of that vision stops. And once they graduate, we've got the child or the parents or mom and dad starting to pay that loan back. And once we build up that cash value, now they've got capital again, right? And I don't know about you, but I got married uh, briefly after college. And so now our concern is a down payment, <coughs> excuse me, a down payment on a house, mm -hmm. right? So if I've repaid my loans and I've got cash value in there again, I can go use that money for a down payment on my house, repay that, and just continually use that policy throughout my lifetime. And then on the back end, I can start to withdraw and draw down retirement income. Perfect. And I, you know, I think you did a good job 
for once about uh, talking about the FAFSA and, and financial aid. Since I've gone through this with both of my kids, life insurance does not count against you. Did you know that some schools will count a 529 against you? Yeah. Uh, so when you start taking that money out of the 529 plan to pay for that year's school, some schools are going to count that as income, which can hurt you getting some free money from the government. Another point you made was really, this is more than just about college. And I, I t sometimes, you know, we need to not focus so much on, on the balance, right? Even if your 529 plan may have a little bit more cash value or assets in there, this is bigger than this. 529s end at college and really your policy really begins after college. Mm, good. That, that, yeah, that uh, was good. Impressive. Yeah, thanks. Good suit today. I, I just, it just came to me. Wow. So we've, we've done a really good job of, and uh, inadvertently we kind of beat up 529 plans. That wasn't yeah. our intent, right? But uh, we, do, we always have to have a comparison. So we're talking about cash value and those things. Now, Anthony, what type of limitations might there be if we start to consider putting uh, a policy on one of our children? One of the limitations are, is going to be because there is, we are using life insurance, there is going to be a death benefit. Certain carriers, well, all carriers have some sort of limit of how much death benefit a child can have. Some of them have a hard, like a million dollar death benefit. Some may have a percentage of the uh, parents. Now, the thing is, and again, even though we're designing this to minimize the death benefit, and maximize cash, when you get a policy on a kid who's, who's younger, even $500 a month can produce a lot of death benefit. So we just got to make sure that, that, that the parents have enough life insurance or have enough uh, death benefit. Yeah, a general rule of thumb is that uh, the parents must have twice as much as the children are being considered for, and then usually kids are capped at a million dollars. There are some ways around that. Of course, you'd find yeah. an exception yeah, to that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's the, that's the general rule. Um, also, one thing that I've found is uh, usually lump sums. Lump sums, if somebody kind of comes in and says, hey, I want to put a lump sum and set it away for a kid's education, uh, again, like Anthony said, is because the, that death benefit can get pretty high pretty quickly for a child. Um, even though we're designing it to not do that, is that uh, it can run into kind of those mech limitations uh, when we try to put a big lump sum on a child. So um, typically, go ahead. Because you mentioned that, I'm actually working on a case like that where somebody's been funding, you know, a, as monthly a monthly amount into a savings account, yeah. and I, I don't know. I think they might have twenty or thirty thousand already in there. Mm. maybe 40, but then the, and they want to do $500 a month. So actually what we did is we created two policies, one to hold the lump sum. Yeah. And then one for the, one for the, for the monthly contribution. The obstacle we're running into here is to make sure that the adults have enough death benefit. Ooh, I'm glad you said that. I have two scenarios that I was, that just came to mind. Number one is I've got a client doing the same thing is what he wants to do is he wants to put in about a thousand dollars a month for a policy on his child, his child's six or seven. And we're hitting that mech limit pretty quickly. And so the limitation I think in this scenario is going to be maybe 8,000 would be the absolute most that we'd be able to get in there, which is pretty high from what I've seen. Um, but then the other thing that just came to mind was that I've got a client that same thing scenario was contributing money to a savings account. And she's got a substantial amount of money in there. And uh, she just realized that her kid is 17 years old and that next year his name is on that account. Ooh. So uh, the day of his birthday, he has the ability to go down there and he has access to all that money in there. Right. Mm. That is, uh, that was the, uh, reason that she approached me about this conversation and said she didn't tell me she had this money and that she was setting it aside for it up until mm -hmm. that point she kind of called me in a panic one morning and said oh shoot I just realized that my kid's 17 you know what options do we have and so what we talked about is kind of moving that money and because 
kind of touched on it a minute ago, but the control that the owner has of that policy is that if I'm an owner and I own that policy on my kid, my kid's the insured, is it's up to me when I transfer that policy over to them, when or if I transfer that policy over to them. So that is a, a big differentiate, differentiation from other types of accounts, 529 plans, mm -hmm. UGMA accounts, those types of things at 18, typically the kid has access to it regardless. And also let me tack onto that if we're talking about college planning, assets in the kid's name count a much higher balance than if it, than if it is in the parent's name. Mm -hmm. So the last thing you want to do when you fill out that FAFSA form is have any assets inside the kids' names. Yep. Um, but uh, when you're talking about things, this conversation, what's funny that I found, Anthony, you can say if you've had this experience, is that a lot of times when you bring this up, we're about halfway through the conversation and I'll have a client that'll kind of sit back in the chair and be like, actually, you know what? my parents had a policy on me. Right? Mm. When I was 18, I had it and I cashed it out. Man, I wish I would have hung on to that thing. How many times have you heard that? Oh, quite a bit. And it's, it's a shame because those, those are whole life policies. Absolutely. Even if they weren't designed for banking, and I'm sure that, sure that they weren't, a, policy, a whole life policy yeah. is 10 years old. That thing is a keeper. Right? So when you look at generations, is grandma and grandpa tried? right? But we just came in and we screwed it up. That's typically what happens in that scenario. So that's kind of one thing I want to touch on. Go ahead. What do you got? Well, no, well, well, on that, what I want, like kind of why we call the firm infinite wealth, mm -hmm. right? Is wealth is not just dollars. It's also cents. Cents meaning education. We want to be able to teach the next generation the truth about money. And if we do that, that's what's going to be infinite. Because all of my clients, they cannot outlive their death benefit. They are going to leave a legacy. But really, everybody is going to leave a legacy. It's just how much of that is dollars and how much of that is a cents. And what we want to be able to do is start teaching the next generation before they're 18. Mm. that uh, how to use a policy, how to focus on creating, on uh, focusing, creating passive income. And if those parents would have done that, that may have limited the child from cashing it out. But second, even when I've done with mine, my, my son's 26, my daughter's 20, I am still the owner. I'm not going to give it to them until they've proven that they are a good steward. And if they're not a good steward, you know what I'm going to do, Chad? I mean, uh, Cameron? I don't know, Dad. What are you gonna do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep it. Yeah. Or pay the premiums and or use it to create more passive income. And then maybe eventually, maybe when they're 30 or 40, they come to their senses. Yeah. And, then I, and then, I will, then I will give it to them. I, I want to share a story here. This is your talk because you, it's not exactly in the lens, but it is right. Is we're talking about educating our children and different ways to do that. And uh, this is a couple of years ago. And uh, I was laying in bed with my son, Declan. I was tucking it in at night. And uh, this is a couple of weeks before his birthday. And I started asking him what he wants for his birthday. And he's sitting there. He's like, oh, you know, I want a Nintendo or a, an Xbox, right? I look mm -hmm. up an Xbox or 700 bucks. And I'm like, what else do you want? <laughs> 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 what else, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, I want a Nintendo Switch. And I look that up and I'm like, 300 bucks so i'm sitting there and i'm laying there and i'm like hey man i was like hey uh how much do you think parents should spend on their kids for their birthday so we kind of started talking about it and um it was maybe another five minute conversation anyways he kind of pipes up and what he says is he goes actually you know what dad he's like uh you can just get me this maze game i forget the name of it now but uh, i look it up on my phone and it was like a ten dollar board game mm. man that hit me so hard i was laying there with my kid and i'm like Dude, I'm conditioning. I'm teaching my kid something right now, right? Mm -hmm. And I was teaching him to settle, right? Mm -hmm. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I sat there and I was like, hey, man, hang on. Let's, let's talk about this for a minute. And, I, and the conversation that I had with him from that point moving forward was I was like, man, listen, you can have anything that you want in this world. I was like, but you're going to have to work for it. Nobody's going to give it to you. And I go, that, in, that includes me or mom, right? And I said, so let's talk about some of the skills that you have that you can then use to create money to go buy these things that you want. And so what we did is we had another 20-minute conversation. 
and we came up with, uh, I think, four different things that he could do, pick up dog poop, mow the yard, clean out trash cans. And so I was like, all right, buddy, I'm going to make up a flyer for you and we'll review it tomorrow. So I took him in, I go, I go to bed or he goes to bed and I go out and I start making up a flyer. And what I did is I called it Project Nintendo Switch mm. and I put his picture on the top of it and I said, Hi, my name's Declan, and I'm saving up to buy a Nintendo Switch. My dad won't give me the money. He said I have to earn it. <laughs> mm, nice. And I said, and then I wrote in there that, hey, I could do these four things, and here's the prices. If you have any of these services that you need done over the next month, please call or text my dad at what. And so we designed this thing up, and we walked around the block three different times, right, to pass this out to mm -hmm. neighbors and stuff. And uh, it's the first time we go, and I'm walking around the block, and He's standing in the driveway. I walk up to the door and I'm knocking on there and I'm handing it to him. I'm like, hey man, I'm your neighbor, introducing ourselves. And people are like, oh, okay, great, thanks. Second time, Declan's up at the door with me, right? Mm, knocking on okay. the door, dropping it off, right? The third time, he's running around and I'm the one standing in the driveway, right? So you kind of saw mm, this progression. Yeah, you saw this progression and this confidence kind of getting instilled in this kid and knowing that, hey, this is a means to an end. The end is the Project Nintendo Switch and here's what I got to do to get there right? It was awesome. And so from his birthday up until that Christmas is he saved up, I think he had $350 is what he saved up right before Christmas. And so what he did is he used his money to go buy the Nintendo Switch. And then he asked everybody else, grandma, grandpa, and mom and dad to buy him certain games, right? Which are 40 bucks, 50 bucks, mm -hmm. whatever they are. So there was a, a huge difference, right? Between how he handles and how he takes care of this Nintendo Switch as opposed to kind of some of his other things, the iPad and the stuff that we just have around the house is, you know, that thing's been, face has been cracked a million times, right? So just a, a really good lesson. We're kind of talking about how we teach kids money. That's one way that I've done it. The way that I plan on using my cash value as my kids are younger is, man, I plan on financing their first car, right? Is I want to be able to bank. I want to be the bank for my kids. If they want to go buy a, a 10, 15, $20,000 car is I'm going to go buy it and they're going to pay me back just like they would Wells Fargo or anybody else. So those are the ways in which I kind of see myself using policies. Um, I have two other things. One other thing here that I want to touch on before we kind of wrap this up, Anthony. Uh, before you do that, that was a great story, Cameron. It's great how we need to teach our kids how not just to get to, to receive money, but to earn money. And that reminds me of a story from Rich Dad, Poor Dad where Robert Kiyosaki says, we, we need to not say, I can't afford this. Instead, we need to ask ourselves, how can I afford this? And that's exactly what you did. There was something he wanted, and he found a way, he found, he, he found a way to earn it. And I guarantee you, he's going to remember that story, and that, that's going, that, that, that was a huge uh, learning lesson. I'll put a I'll good put job, a, Cam. Thanks, buddy. I'll put that flyer in our meeting notes. It's a it's a pretty cool little flyer. That'd be cool. That would, oh, that yeah. People could use oh, yeah. It. That's cool. But uh, the last piece that I want to touch on is uh, kind of the a technical aspect of it is that when we put a policy in place, is there are certain riders uh, that should be on a child's policy, right? And they have uh, what they're called as they're called an, an option to purchase additional insurance, and they're all kind of that, that's the intent, but they're all kind of named or called different things with different insurance carriers but really the essence of it is that you have a rider on that policy for your kid and at certain ages you can automatically purchase more insurance on that child without any further underwriting so that's a good piece to make sure that uh, that you've got on a policy if you have a policy you're not sure if it has that rider if you want us to review it call us let us know we'll take a look at it um, but the next thing that i've got down here is kind of the process of getting started is usually kind of the, some of the questions that clients will have for us is, okay, yeah, I want to put a policy on my kid. Now what? Does, does he take an exam? Right? When we're, yeah. when, we're, when we're adults and we want a policy, we got to go take an exam. Uh, the answer is no, don't worry. Our kids don't have to get an exam. Uh, if you're a minor, what they do is they just pull your medical records and they review that. So it's simply just an application. We run an illustration, submit it to the insurance company on what we want. We tell them how much insurance is on the parents. And then they uh, review the medical history. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, in, in talking about that, right, a couple of highlights is make sure that uh, if we do do uh, a policy on a child, we've got to make sure that it's properly structured. We're not running into the MEC limitations. We're not overfunding it too much. Um, make sure that we got some high cash value, which is utilizing that PUA rider is make sure that the parents and the child understand that PUA rider and the flexibility that we have with that moving forward. So. 
Hope that helps. I like to say in summary, I think the most important reason to get a policy on a child is to teach them how money works. And yeah. the, the best way to do that is for them to do it with their own money. And a policy is a way not only pay for college, but just, just to give them a good start going forward. It, it's so much more than just paying for college. Yep. And again, if you guys have uh, any policies that you want us to take a look at or interested in uh, looking at some illustrations for something on your, on your kids for college education or finance and whatever it may be, uh, you've got that link in the meeting notes uh, to schedule a 15-minute conversation with Anthony or myself. Perfect. And to get a more detailed information on the pros and cons of getting a life insurance policy on our kids, check out the book, Eight Perspectives on Prosperity Economics. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Go make it an awesome day. Take care. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode. Also, check out our website, InfiniteWealthConsultants.com to find our podcast along with other additional resources.